My name is Dominic Genex. About a year ago, I built a, a Sumerian lyre or harp, and I posted a YouTube video uh, with my son Cameron playing that lyre. Uh, since that time, I've received questions on how the, the instrument was designed and constructed. So I thought I'd put together another video on the, uh, the building of that harp. And, and uh, I don't have uh, video footage, but I have some still photos and I can explain uh, the process as it progressed with the, the issues and the thoughts that were happening at the time. So a little background on myself. I am a musician and I play uh, a few instruments. I play guitar, bass, piano, keyboards, and some other things. Um, now over the last few years I have made some basic instruments, mostly cigar box guitars um, and also some other um, like thumb pianos and things of that nature. But um, I started thinking about, you know, making something different, um, maybe a little more ambitious, not too much more, but it's just something different, something that would maybe stretch my, uh, my skills and experience a bit. Uh, and I also enjoy reading history, uh, especially ancient history. So for me, it's very, it's fascinating to learn what was going on thousands of years ago and where we came from. But anyway, here uh, in this uh, section here, I'm showing some of the cigar box guitars that I've made in the past. So one day I came across some sites that described a Sumerian lyre or harp uh, from ancient Mesopotamia and that it was one of the oldest uh, instruments ever discovered. It really got my attention. I did some reading on it and I'll put some of the links below to some of the sites that I saw. And the story was really interesting to me. Uh, I, I looked at the pictures of the lyre and thought, you know, maybe I could make this. It looked fairly straightforward. And in general, it was. However, uh, there were some mechanical challenges that I did not quite understand at the time, but that were soon to be discovered. And uh, even though I have a degree in engineering, specifically electrical engineering, and I took all the physics classes and the statics and dynamics classes, uh, reading and working those math problems is way different than actually putting those concepts to work. One of my first thoughts was, you know, how big should this thing be? And I thought about how I would want to play the instrument. And I also thought about the reality of where it would go in my house. And I uh, imagined this dialogue with my wife and that imagined dialogue wasn't going well. Uh, I'd seen various sizes in the photos and ancient depictions in the, these websites that I had come across, and I'm going to show some of those here. At, I, in the end, I decided to make it about two to three feet, you know, wide and tall. My next step was figuring out the lengths and the angles of the various structures. Uh, I could not locate that information anywhere on any of these websites. I probably could have dug a little deeper, but um, at some point I just thought, you know, I'm going to improvise a bit. So basically I found a good photo of an accurate replica of the liar. I zoomed in on it as much as I could on my computer screen, and then I measured the various dimensions of the instrument. Then once I had those numbers, I calculated the ratios for the various part lengths and angles and noted down the sizes of the parts that I would need based on those ratios and my target size that I was looking at, that two to three foot uh, size. So then at that point, made a trip to the Home Depot to purchase the materials. Uh, I think I used their basic pine wood products. For the soundboard, I sampled several pieces of wood until I found one that seemed to resonate uh, the most when I tapped on it, basically with my fingernail. Um, in hindsight, uh, I might have gone with better quality wood, but honestly, the wood I used uh, really uh, has not had any issues in terms of breaking. There were some bending and warping issues, which I'll get into later, but I think those might have occurred uh, regardless of the wood type, uh, as, as I'm going to explain in the uh, future sections here. 
Um, I also bought a kitchen drawer handle uh, from Home Depot that would later be used as the saddle for the strings, which is not in this photo, but can be seen later. And here I'm just showing the basically the raw wood parts uh, that I bought at Home Depot. The cutting, the drilling, the painting, and the assembling was straightforward. Um, I used a wood stain for the soundboard and regular craft paint for the supports. I bought the plastic bull toy from Amazon to keep that bovine theme that the Sumerians associated with their lyres. Uh, and this is also where the mistakes started coming in during this initial, initial construction. Um, and because basically, uh, to sum it up, I just underestimated the enormous force that the strings would exert on the structure. And because of that underestimation, I used inferior techniques and supplies to secure everything together. So basically in this phase of the project, I used simple nails and wood glue to put everything together. And as I mentioned, that was a big mistake and I was uh, gonna find that out with time. So here I'm just kind of showing uh, some of the uh, stages of assembly and painting. So I purchased from Amazon the strings and the tuning pegs shown here. I use glass craft beads at the ends of the strings to secure the string ends to the bridge. Uh, each bead has a hole in it that goes straight through it. So here's some photos. One is the initial completion con uh, construction completion without any adjustments at all. It looks good. And with me just plucking it here and there, it sounded good too. I was really happy and I thought it was a success. And, and to a degree it was, at least a good start and also a good chance to learn some things coming up. <laughs> so I put the liar in a, the guest bedroom inside my house, but then a couple hours later I heard a big crashing noise coming from that room. I do not have a picture of that result. I should have taken a picture, but I didn't. But what happened was that the top bar of the liar broke off from the supporting struts due to the pressure from the strings, the force of the strings. So in talking with a friend at work, this this guy that I know that plays in an orchestra, he said this is pretty common for harps in general. He said that that top bar will, you know, start twisting down and eventually fall off and they have to do regular maintenance on these harps to prevent that from happening. So I had to think about how I was going to remediate that issue. So to address that, that first issue, I bought and affixed these metal strips to each side of the connection between the top bar and the supporting struts. And then bolts and nuts were used to connect the strips on each side. This solution has really proved to be very effective. Uh, nothing so far has, <laughs> has caused those strips to bend or move in any kind of a way. And, and I haven't had any further issues uh, in this area. Issue number two occurred not long after the first one was fixed. And this second issue was also due to pressure from the strings and inadequate con construction methods and materials. As seen in the one photo here, the bridge came off of the front sounding board. So at that point, I also noticed issue number three, also caused by string pressure. And it was an in inward bending and warping of the front sound board. So I addressed both of those issues at the same time. Uh, issue number two, which was the bridge issue, was fixed by using a larger piece of wood and securing it to the soundboard with the bolts and nuts going straight through the other side to the other soundboard. And at the same time, I inserted additional wood pieces to the inside of the instrument um, between the sounding boards to mitigate that inward bending and warping. And um, both of those solutions have held in place. I haven't had any other issues in these areas. I don't have photos of issue number four, but it was also due to the string pressure and force, which in this case resulted in a general horizontal twisting of the entire instrument to one side. And in general, I noticed that as I fixed any particular one issue, it would 
you know, generally cause other issues because of new forces coming into play. And I'm guessing that any mechanical engineer or someone with any mechanical or instrument design experience would have known all this stuff up front and planned for it. But, you know, this was my time to learn these issues. Um, so luckily, no one got hurt in the process. And seriously, it, that was something I thought about a lot afterwards. Um, but um, the fix for this particular issue shown here was basically adding support at the base of the instrument to counteract the forces that were causing the twisting. And again, like the other solutions, this has proved to be effective. I have not had any other twisting issues with the instrument. Here are photos of the final fixes unpainted and then another photo with everything with the final painting. I did also use a clear spray enamel coating on top of the stain in the black paint. So for tuning, there are challenges for figuring out how to tune these instruments that are ancient like this. Mostly since the translation of the musical notation is lost to the ages. Uh, but, uh, and of course there's no recordings of any of these instruments and no sound recordings. So musical historians can only really deduce and take their best guess as to what the sounds were like and how they were notated. But they do know quite a bit by studying later instruments and cultures that have known sounds and notations and then working backwards. So I've included some website links, uh, or one in particular that I used to tune my instrument, and I've a couple of others as well that are interesting to read through that kind of shows that process of, of you know, starting from a point and then kind of working backwards. And specifically, I followed the Dumbrill, Professor Dumbrill Liar, uh, part four or five video. I show a picture of that video here. Uh, and this guy's really, he's, he's very entertaining, very intense. Um, now, the first string on the lyre in the Dumbril, Dumbril video starts with an E note. However, I tuned my instrument starting with C on the first string, uh, but I kept the relationships and the intervals between the strings the same as Professor Dumbril. Generally speaking, it's a, a Lydian scale, but it, with 11 strings and notes. And if you listen to Dr. Dumbrill's uh, explanation, they give, you know, at least he gives each string kind of a name. It's kind of a mode type of thing for each string. Thanks for watching this video. Hopefully it was entertaining and, and maybe helpful if you're thinking about building a similar uh, instrument. And hopefully you can avoid, if you do that, you can avoid some of the pitfalls and problems that I ran into. And here is another video of my son Cameron playing the instrument.